Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Can you guys hear me? If I can just get a nod, Nora, can you hear me? Okay, I wasn't sure if I would be seen or not. So first of all, hi everyone. My name is Patty Urena and I'm the coordinator of education and outreach with the Chief of Family Trust. And I wanna thank you all for joining us this morning for this speaker program on guardianship versus power of attorney. This is such an important topic. And um, in light of everything that's going on in the country and in the world, we really appreciate you taking the time to spend some time with us this morning and um, learn about guardianship versus power of attorney. This is unusual for us as well. We've never done a program um, remotely with, with I'm in one location, Greg Benzie, who also works for Achieve a Family Trust and has set all of this up is in another location. And then our speaker, Nora, is, is in, her, in another location as well. So please um, bear with us as we maybe work through any technical issues that may come up. Um, but before we get started, just, just a couple of reminders. I did send everyone the slide set. So you should have it in your email if, if you haven't checked. You do have a copy of the PowerPoint. This program will be recorded and put on our website. So if you wanna go back and listen to anything, if you don't get to finish it or, or miss something, it will be up on our website. And you know, I have to tell you with all the work we do in the community, this is a question that comes up all the time. What's the difference between guardianship versus power of attorney? What should I do? And Nora Gigchatha is really just an amazing attorney and we're so lucky to have her speak for us this morning. Um, we, we consult with her a lot on this and ask a lot of questions of her. So I'm excited to introduce her and I'm again, Nora, we're so appreciative that you're here with us this morning as well. This is a, we have a huge audience this morning. So, um, but it was actually, the registration was quite big even before we had to change it to a remote version only. So again, thank you all for bearing with us this morning and taking time to, to listen to this program. I'm gonna let Nora introduce herself, but also tell how she wants to proceed with the program as far as questions and answers go. So thank you all. Great, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to all the Achieva folks and the great team there, to Patty, Greg, uh, Amy, Jackie, Maria, all of the people that I, I am fortunate to deal with at Achieva, and um, it is a pleasure to be here. As Patty mentioned, this is, you know, a first in many ways. Um, this is the first speaking I've done during this COVID crisis. This is my first in-person webinar, so please bear with us, and particularly me, because I am not the most tech-savvy person. Um, and my thought is today that um, we, I'm gonna, gonna see me for a little bit and then we're gonna transition to the slides. Um, in order to have it not be distracting, particularly to people who might be on a, a smartphone or a smaller electronic device, we thought it would be easier if my video was, was removed so that you could focus on the substance of the slides. Um, normally, when I speak in person, I very much like and, and welcome questions um, in the middle of the presentation, because if you're thinking something or you haven't quite understood what I said, there's a very good chance that you're not the only one. Or you may have some experience or insight that you can offer to really add value. The one distinction here is that I need to actually read those questions and that may distract um, and take away a little bit from the substance of the presentation. So what I'm thinking to do is to go through the presentation and at various intervals where I feel that we've, we've covered a particular topic to its end and I'm ready to transition to another one, I will attempt to read some of the questions. So if you do have questions, please send them in. Um, and if it turns out that that is too distracting or doesn't work well, then I will attempt to take those for the end of the presentation. The one thing I'll mention is, is that some of the questions you might have, particularly at the end of the first section, I may answer in section two or three. So it may be better to hold them until the end anyway, just to avoid um, a flood of questions that are ultimately going to be answered. But in any event, I very much welcome questions, input, and likewise, if, if, I'm, you know, if I explain something and you've experienced it differently, or you've been explained differently by another attorney or another parent or, or a colleague, please let me know so we can talk about what that discrepancy may be. Um, and I, you know, I really want to thank Achieva again for allowing me to, to access, you know, its community base and to hopefully add some value to what you know about guardianships and powers of attorney. And also somewhat in jest, but it's actually true, I thank Achieva for giving me a reason to shower before 8 a.m. and to put on adult clothes for the first time in about five weeks. So it, it's pretty exciting. Um, the, the title of today's presentation is Guardianships versus Power of Attorney. 
Uh, and what I'm, I'm really trying to do is to help the audience understand what the distinction is. Uh, this is not a CE, a continuing education qualified program. So this is really truly just to add value to the community to help you understand the difference. Um, and I oftentimes find that the words guardian or agent or custodian or, you know, they're, they're used interchangeably and sometimes uh, inconsistently or incorrectly when I'm putting on my legal cap, knowing what, what the technical term is. And, and for the most part, if you're just talking to your friends of the community, misusing that term might not really have any significance. But if you are dealing with a healthcare provider, uh, with a financial professional, or with an attorney, the, the actual legal capacity um, or the role that someone has with respect to another individual is very important. And so I hope that from this today, we can take away some of that terminology and and you can be able to apply it to your situation and to the situation of your loved ones. Um, so with that, I'm going to attempt to remove my video and to put on the slides. If anyone um, has problems with the, the, the technology here, please do send them in and hopefully Greg can see them and help us to address it. All right, so we are gonna go right into the substance of our presentation, which is guardianships versus powers of attorney. Um, and what we're talking about here um, is essentially the appointment of a legal representative to act on behalf of another individual. Um, and as we're gonna talk about, that representative could be a guardian, it could be an agent, it could be a statutory healthcare representative. But the, the gist of it is that most of us um, at some point in our lives are going to need to have someone else act for us. So this is something that not only we should think about for our loved ones who may be aged or disabled or have some sort of special need, but we also need to think about this for ourselves. Because again, most of us are going to have some period in our lives, perhaps, you know, a temporary period, not a permanent situation, where we need someone to step in and make decisions for us. Um, and if we just look at the normal aging degeneration progress process, um, you know, roughly 10% of individuals 65 or over suffer from some sort of dementia, and 50 per persons uh, over 85 years or older suffer from some form of dementia. In addition, many of us um, will unfortunately be involved in some sort of an accident, um, whether that is a, you know, a, a car accident, some sort of a, a fall. Uh, we may be in, a, in a, you know, a, a temporarily induced coma for a period of time while we're receiving treatment, or we may have a, you know, a stroke or a heart attack, something else that takes us away from the ability to make decisions on our own. And so this is something that we should be considering for not only our loved ones, but for ourselves, because this is, you know, it's not a fun thing to think about, but it's a reality. And it's something that we, most of us are going to end up facing. So who should consider this? Well, absolutely everyone. You know, not only my, my, my children that I care about, my special needs loved ones, but also myself. I need to think about this for myself and everybody that I may interact with and provide some sort of advocacy for. Um, there is a big distinction between the type of legal representatives that are appointed for someone who is under 18 years of age and someone who is over 18 years of age. Um, and I'm gonna probably repeat this concept a couple times during this presentation, but generally, when someone hits 18 under Pennsylvania law, they are, they've reached the age of majority. Uh, there's this legal concept, the Latin term called sui juris, which basically means at that point, the law presumes that someone has the capacity and is able to make certain decisions on his or her own, and importantly, is able, into, is able to enter into contracts and take certain other measures um, that, that most individuals would. Before age 18, someone is presumed to not be sui juris. So before age 18, under age 18, generally the parent and natural guardian have this authority based on, on their status as just that, the parents and natural guardian, that enables them to be the, the de facto legal representative without any special court order, without any paperwork. It's simply by virtue of being the parent, they are able to be involved, to make decisions, to advocate for their minor loved one. Now, of course, there can be some exceptions. Um, you know, an exception could be if someone's parental rights have been terminated or in some way diminished. Um, in addition, 
there are certain instances, and we're going to talk about those very briefly, where a minor, someone under 18, may come into some sort of money. There may be an inheritance that's left to them. They may receive money under a life insurance contract or a settlement. And in that case, we actually have specific statutes that address what the parent can take control of as the parent and natural guardian versus when the court must appoint someone else or provide another protective mechanism to protect that minor's assets. Um, and the big, the big, you know, sort of critical date is when that minor loved one turns 18, we then say, okay, this minor is now sui juris. The authority has traditionally as the parent and natural guardian is now stopping. Um, while some medical providers and financial institutions may continue to involve the parent, you know, in theory, they shouldn't without the now 18 year old child giving the authority. So when, when the critical age is 18, when it comes to capacity and legal representatives, and at that point, we then think about, okay, do we need a, a power of attorney instrument or do we need to pursue guardianship? And as we're gonna talk about, generally when, it, when someone reaches age 18, if they have the capacity, they can typically sign a power of attorney instrument. If they don't have the capacity, then a court appointed guardianship is going to need to be pursued. And we're gonna get into those details in a lot more detail. One thing I just want to mention that that um, has come up on occasion from other similar presentations is, you know, I oftentimes have some people in the audience or some clients who always bring it to my attention that if they do have a minor child for whom they are the parent or natural guardian, um, you know, they're generally under HIPAA entitled to mental, you know, mental health information, to medical information. But HIPAA, federal law, really draws a line when it comes to psychotherapy records. So generally, you know, the parental rights can access the mental health information, which may be the diagnosis, you know, the, the symptoms, the treatment plan, the medications. But when it comes to those psychotherapy notes, the, the conversations during counseling, those are generally something that's sheltered. There's an exception to the, the HIPAA there, unless the minor authorizes release of those information. So that's one sort of distinction that, that is sometimes brought up, particularly for someone who's advocating for um, a minor loved one with some mental health issues. So I just wanted to, to point that out. So I, I want to talk about this just quickly. If I mentioned the situation where, you know, generally you're the parent and natural guardian, that's sort of the inheritance thor authority under Pennsylvania law. But there are some instances where there is a court appointed guardian for a minor, someone under 18. And I mentioned that circumstance when a minor is coming into money. And there is a threshold. And generally, if the minor is coming into more than $25,000, then the court is going to have to appoint either a guardian for that minor to hold that money. A parent, as we're gonna see, can be a co-guardian, but cannot be the sole guardian whenever there's more than 25,000 involved. The court can use a sequestered account or the court could use um, a custodian or a trustee chip type relationship. And uh, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but one of the things you'll see about the slides is they can, some of my slides contain a lot of detailed statutory sites. It, it's some of the site verbatim. Uh, I'm not gonna go through that all in detail. It was intended to be a reference, perhaps more of a reference than you want. So if you don't want it, disregard it. But it's something that someone can go back to and look at down the line if that's helpful. So when do we see these, these court appointed guardians for minors? Well, oftentimes it's again, what's in the minors coming into money. So, you know, grandmother leaves money to grandson under the will, uh, doesn't uh, provide for trust provisions or custodial language. The, the amount is in excess of $25,000. So the court is going to have to do something, either a guardianship, a custodian, or perhaps a, a trust will be created. That generally can be avoided if someone is gifting or leaving money to a minor and they do it in a secured way. So consulting with a good attorney or financial professional, you know, money could be left into a uniform transfers to minors, a uniform gifts to minors act account. It could be left in a 529 college savings account. And if you're familiar with the disability community, now a 529A ABLE or disability savings account. Uh, so there's ways that money can be left in a secure fashion, which is always good to do, that can avoid the need for a court appointed guardian for a minor. And more importantly, leaving the money in that fashion can also preserve means tested public benefits for that minor, either during minority or when he or she, he shits, uh, hits age 18. We could talk for hours about that, but I just wanted to throw that in very quickly. Um, 
Here is the statutory section regarding a, you know, the minors coming into money over $25,000 and when a guardian is unnecessary and it's when the net value is $25,000 or less. Um, and you know, this, this section talks about who can be appointed as a guardian for a minor. And again, this is generally the guardian for uh, financial purposes. Um, and it has to be someone who is um, generally uh, not a parent unless the parent is going to be a co-guardian with another corporate fiduciary. Um, so, and there's this concept of a sequestered deposit wherein the court can direct that the money the minor is receiving goes into a bank account where basically it can't be touched absent a court order until that minor reaches age 18. And in age 18, the bank releases the money to the minor. So let's talk a little bit about the situation where we have a loved one who is over 18 or is going to turn 18 soon. You know, that again, that, that inherent authority as parent and natural guardian is going to cease at age 18. At age 18, an individual is presumed to have capacity, this term sui juris. Um, and someone who has the capacity at age 18 is able to sign a power of attorney document um, if that person has the requisite capacity. And we're gonna talk about that standard. If someone doesn't have the capacity to sign a power of attorney instrument, then generally speaking, there's going to need to be a guardianship proceeding initiated so that the court can appoint a legal representative to act on behalf of that person. There are different types of legal representatives for persons over 18 in Pennsylvania. If we have a power of attorney instrument, and this is where someone over 18 who has the requisite capacity, who's willing to do this, who voluntarily does it, this individual can sign a power of attorney document or instrument. Um, and that instrument, the person who signs it is known as the principal. They sign it, gr granting authority to an individual who's known as an agent. And the terms of the power of attorney document set forth what that agent's authority is. There are generally three uh, broad categories of agents e or powers of attorney in Pennsylvania. One would be a financial power of attorney. This is where an individual appoints an agent to make decisions regarding money, finances, taxes, litigation, things that are not personal, not healthcare related, but rather relevant to their finances, to their assets. The other type of power of attorney instrument is a healthcare power of attorney. This is also known as a healthcare proxy in some instances. This is where the principal appoints another individual to make decisions regarding his or her health care. Um, so typically it's if I become incapacitated, the authority that I've granted to my healthcare agent under that document kicks in and that individual can make certain decisions for me. The decisions that the agent can make are limited by two things. One is the terms of the power of attorney instrument and then also we have the statutory framework which is the overlay um, which sort of dictates what can or can't be in those instruments um, and we'll talk about that in greater detail. There is another type of power of attorney that that's not so often referenced unless you're involved with the mental health community which is a mental health care power of attorney or proxy and we actually have a separate uh, statutory chapter it's chapter 58 um, of our, our Pennsylvania States and Fiduciaries Code, which provides for a mental health care proxy or power of attorney. Um, and that is to deal with mental health issues. Now, I, you know, in my mind, I think there's a, very much an overlap between health care and mental health, but we're going to talk about the sort of some of the key distinguishing factors when we get into the weeds a little bit. So we have these agents under the power of attorney instruments. We're gonna talk about advanced directives and healthcare declarations. And those are, are statements of the individual's wishes. So if we're going back to that term of the principal, these would be statements of my wishes as to what type of treatment I want if I am in a certain situation, either an end stage condition or if I am in a psychiatric facility, that statement of my wishes is what my, my healthcare proxy or my healthcare agent will follow in the event that I am in one of those conditions. So, and, and these documents, sometimes they are combined in, in one document. They're, so in one document may appoint an agent and also set forth my wishes. Sometimes they are separate documents. There's many different ways to, to handle this. So I think that can create a lot of confusion, um, you know, not only among legal practitioners, but also among, you know, lay persons when they're trying to figure out what exactly it is that, that they're looking at. What is the document? What is it that they need? 
when we, we switch over, so we have these power of attorney where someone has the capacity to appoint someone as their agent, to give that agent certain authority. The, the another type of legal representative is a guardian. This is where someone does not have the power to appoint an agent, um, or perhaps the person had appointed an agent when they had capacity, but something has happened. That agent, that power of attorney document, that agency relationship, isn't broad enough to do certain things. And now the individual is incapacitated, but the agent doesn't have the authority under the law or the instrument to do what needs to be done. So we need to go into court for a guardianship. So a guardianship is for an incapacitated adult who's over 18. So that is the other type of representative, a guardian. And there are two general types of guardians. The statute uh, talks about these. We're going to get into those, those statutory sections, but there's a guardian of the person, similar to a healthcare agent or a health care power of attorney. This is the, the, the person, the guardian that oversees matters, you know, regarding medical treatment, uh, placement, housing, things of that nature. And then we also have a guardian of the estate, which is comparable to the financial agent under the power of attorney, overseeing finances, things to do with money, contracts, um, legal documents, and things of that nature. And lastly, we have another category, which is a statutory health care representative. This statutory health care representative um, is something that only kicks in, again, for generally for people who are over 18, who are incapacitated, uh, they can't make their decisions, and they are in some sort of an end stage terminal, I'm going to use the word critical, although I don't think that's in the statute, they are in this critical situation where it's, it's really an important decision needs to be made. The person doesn't have the, the capacity at that moment to make the decision, and they lack an agent under a power of attorney, and they lack a court-appointed guardian. And in the event that the, the criteria are triggered, uh, healthcare professionals can then rely upon the statutory healthcare representatives, which is basically sort of your closest family members in order of, of priority. Um, and it can even, if, and I've seen cases where there are no family members, you know, there's someone is in a nursing home or the hospital, they don't have any parents, they don't have any children, they, they don't have any brothers, and it ends up being, you know, a, a, somewhat a friend, someone who has knowledge regarding that individual's wishes and preferences, and that's in the statute. And I've seen that happen where, you know, the neighbor who was close to this, this, you know, widower for, you know, 30 years is able to come in because the, the statutory criteria are, are met and to make certain health care decisions for that individual. So that statutory health care representative, it's, it's a great tool that we have available under Pennsylvania law to us, but the application is very limited. It only kicks in, um, again, if someone is in sort of this end stage condition. Uh, so it's not going to be a substitute for a general health care power of attorney or guardian of the person person um, that, that someone may need if they can't make just sort of normal decisions, everyday decisions regarding their health care and their personal needs. So, and, and I'm going to probably say this a bunch of times because I really want to make sure we hit it home, but what is the difference between the agent under the power of attorney versus the guardian? Again, the, the agent under the power of attorney is only an option for someone who has capacity to sign that document. So at some point, someone must have had the capacity to sign it. Now, you know, as, as you may know, dealing with elderly persons or persons that have certain mental health issues, you know, capacity is oftentimes um, a fleeting thing and it can be very temporal. Um, you know, I have clients who, you know, they may have uh, some mental health issues or other diagnoses where, you know, after certain medications or certain times of the day, they are are much more able to focus and perhaps would be able to sign a power of attorney instrument than other times of the day. And all that matters is when that individual signs the power of attorney document that he or she had the capacity to do it. The fact that the capacity may, may not be present the next day or later in the day is not really important. It's when the document was signed. And under Pennsylvania law, the statutory default, and most power of attorney instruments will also say this, is that the power of attorney instrument is, is referred to as durable, meaning that it remains valid if the principal, the person who granted the agent the authority, later becomes incapacitated. So that's a key distinction, whereas the court-appointed guardian is for someone who does not have capacity. So it's either an adult who lacks capacity to sign a power of attorney, who didn't sign a power of attorney previously when he or she did have capacity, um, and it could also be for minors who are, you know, we talked about this, this is with respect to minors only, who are due funds in excess of $25,000. 
there are also instances where there may be a power of attorney in place where we still need to go in to get a guardianship. And I, I hinted to that earlier. That could be where the power of attorney document doesn't contain broad enough powers. Maybe the healthcare agent wants to um, authorize ECT on, on behalf of someone who's in a, a psychiatric facility, if that power of attorney instrument doesn't authorize that, then we may need a court order to do that. There are also, ca also cases where there are power of attorney instruments in place, but they only name one agent, which is the spouse. The spouse is now predeceased or has dementia and can't serve. So even though there's a power of attorney in place, it didn't go the length to name backup or successor agents. So then we are we were forced to go into court to get a guardian if the principal now lacks capacity capacity to sign another one. And there are also sort of battles of the power of the attorney instruments, right? And you, you may have seen this where, you know, oftentimes it's, you know, two children fighting over the authority to help a parent. But I've also seen it with, you know, parents fighting over authority with their, you know, adult child where they had, you know, each of the parents had the adult child sign a power of attorney at different times. Now the parents who are separated, uh, you know, don't get along and, and we have to go into court so that a judge can adjudicate and decide who the legal decision maker is going to be. So, uh, you know, going back to these concepts, who appoints the representative. Under the power of attorney instrument, it is the principal, it is the individual that is deciding who his or her representative, that agent is the term, who the agent is going to be. That's really beneficial because most of us would rather that we decide who's going to make decisions for us rather than a court decide. Courts do great jobs, but you know we, we know who we think would be best suited and who we would want to make decisions for us, which is why even for someone who doesn't have a disability or a special need or who's not you know elderly, it's still good to have these power of attorney documents in place because most of us, again, and sometimes it's it's sudden, it's sooner than we think, it's unexpected, we're going to have a period of incapacity and I, you know, would much rather say, look, I want it to be, you know, my husband, and if not him, one of my siblings, and absolutely not the other sibling, because I have some family history. And if I haven't said that in a power of attorney document, and I become incapacitated, then a court is going to decide. And a court may make a decision that would be not necessarily consistent with my wishes. So the power of attorney, the, the principal, the individual decides who the agent is, and also decides the scope or the authority that that agent is going to have. We compare that to a guardianship, which is where the court is appointing a guardian and the statute, the guardianship statute dictates what powers that guardian has. In some instances, the mere appointment of a guardian authorizes the guardian to do certain things, but the statute has certain carve outs and basically says if a guardian wants to do certain medical uh, decisions or certain financial planning, like estate planning, the guardian must go back and get court approval before the guardian can do that. So as you can see, the guardianship, it's a much more restrictive framework because the statute sets forth and the court is going to ultimately have to approve what the agent can do, whereas the power of attorney instrument, it can be much more liberal. And of course, going into court to get a guardianship is an extra time and, and expense and in some instances, a loss of privacy. And as we'll talk about, when someone, the inherent part of the guardianship is someone is adjudicated to be incapacitated. And that means that certain of their rights are taken away. Whereas with the power of attorney instrument, we don't have that. You know, as long as the principal remains capacitated, that principal can revoke the power of attorney, can, can appoint a new agent, can sign another power of attorney, can change what the agent can do. So there are pros and cons um, to both the power of attorney and the guardianship, but ultimately someone's capacity is what's going to dictate what is the, the appropriate course, at least initially. And here on this slide, I have sort of a general comparison of the guardianship versus a power of attorney. Again, the name of the legal representative in a guardianship, it is the guardian. And as we're gonna talk about, we, we mentioned a guardian of the estate versus guardian of the person. There's also a limited versus a plenary guardian. A uh, limited guardian means that the court decides that someone lacks capacity to do certain things, but perhaps not all things. So the court decides that they cannot make decisions in one area and appoints an agent to make those decisions with the individual Individual, the, the alleged incapacitated person or the partially incapacitated person 
retaining some rights as to other decisions versus a plenary guardianship. That is where the court finds that the individual is totally incapacitated, cannot make any decisions. So the authority of the guardian is plenary. It is not limited in any sense. Um, again, the power of attorney legal representative is the agent who appoints the legal rep. Guardianship, it's the court upon petition of an interested party. But on the power of attorney, it's the individual known as the principal. Again, the powers of a legal rep for the guardianship, it's, it's determined by statute with certain powers requiring advanced court approval. For a power of attorney, the principal decides what powers the agent is going to have. Who can remove the legal representative in a guardianship? The court can modify the guardianship. So the court can determine that someone has regained capacity, can determine that a guardian needs to be removed or replaced for some reason. So upon petition, there's a review hearing, the court can modify that guardianship. With the power of attorney, generally the principal can remove the agent that he or she is appointed. Now, if the principal lacks capacity to do that because they're now in a coma or in the nursing home with Alzheimer's, the court is able to remove an agent if the court feels that the agent is not acting in the individual's best interest. The governing instrument that, that sets forth this legal authority is an order of court for a guardianship and it's the power of attorney instrument in that context. And when does the authority end? Well, in both cases, and this is something that I oftentimes uh, see, you know, I, I hear people say, I'm my mom's agent, so there's an assumption that when mom dies, I, I as her agent, I'm going to be wrapping up her affairs, or I can still do things after she passes. Um, or the same thing, I am the court-appointed guardian for my disabled adult child. If he forbid passes away early, I'm able to wrap up his affairs and decide where assets go. No, the, the authority of a guardian or of an agent under a power of attorney terminates upon the individual's death. So upon the incapacitated person's death or the principal's death, that authority terminates. It can also be terminated earlier by the court in, in the case of a guardianship or by a court or the principal in connection with the power of attorney. So one thing just to talk about briefly is, as you might be thinking, well, you know, the guardianship is more restrictive. We have to go to the court and we'll talk about that process. But, you know, the court is involved and, you know, that there's, there's certainly an extra, extra time in doing that. There's extra expense. There's a loss of privacy. So some people might say, well, we really don't like that. You know, that, that's, that seems like something we'd want to avoid at all costs. But I can also tell you that, you know, I've seen a lot of cases where there's a power of attorney in place, which is certainly the path of least resistance, but there is no oversight, in that, or I shouldn't say not necessarily no oversight, but it's, if there is a guardian, the court is monitoring to a certain extent what that guardian is doing. There are annual reports that are required. Some counties have guardianship departments. Um, they will make inquiry. So the court is making sure that the legal representative, that the guardian is generally doing what it is supposed to do. With the power of attorney, um, no one is really watching what the agent is doing. In theory, the principal is watching, but if the principal becomes incapacitated, there may be no one else that has access to those bank records to see what the agent is doing. So as you can imagine, there are some times where if you have an agent who's unscrupulous or has bad intentions or perhaps you know just has a good heart but not a good head on their shoulders, the agent can do a lot of damage if they're not doing what they need to do. And it might be some time before someone else in the family or someone else in the community realizes that this agent isn't acting and finally gets it to the court's attention. So in some ways, a guardianship provides an extra layer of protection to an individual. Again, only available if someone is incapacitated to a certain extent, but there can really be a benefit to that, um, particularly if you're concerned about, you know, who's going to watch over my loved one when I'm not there. Well, the guardianship can provide, a, a, you know, some peace of mind. The same result could be accomplished with, um, you know, powers of attorney to have your, your special needs loved ones sign powers of attorney that name, you know, backup successor agents that you find to be responsible people, but there's always sort of some risk there because you don't know what circumstances are going to change. So that's just a little, little side there. Um, I keep talking about the standard of capacity to sign a power of attorney. And, um, you know, there is this rebuttable presumption um, that someone has capacity. You know, they're, they're 18, they're presumed to be sui juris, that, that lovely term. So they're presumed to have capacity. 
Um, and there is not a black or white, a, a bright line test for capacity. Um, and, and, you know, the, the court cases are not clear. And as you can imagine, even if the court cases were clear, determining whether someone meets a, blight, a bright line test is oftentimes very subjective. Um, so capacity is, is somewhat of a, of a difficult concept. There's no necessarily clear cut answer unless someone, you know, is, is truly, you know, in a vegetative state or has a severe traumatic brain injury or extremely low IQ. It, it, and it, capacity can be fluid. Again, it can come and go. It can be temporal. Um, you know, so there's all sorts of things that affect this. But generally speaking, the capacity is when the individual, and we're talking about that principal again, who might be signing a power of attorney, is able to give consent and understand the power that he or she is giving to the agent. So, you know, and judge, there's a judge, Ott, um, who's out of one of our Eastern counties, who has said in a few presentations that generally it, he finds that in order to be able to sign a power of attorney, the, the, and that says natura, which is, should say nature, my apologies, but the individual has to understand the nature of the authority being granted, which means if it's a, if it's a healthcare power of attorney, they have to understand that, hey, I'm, I'm a, you know, an eight, a 20 year old um, with Down syndrome, I am giving my mom the authority to make medical decisions. I don't have to understand the complexity between surgical option A or B. I don't have to understand you know, all of the medication terms and, and what, what, you know, all of those medical things that you or I may have difficult understanding anyway. I have to understand that I have the ability to make medical decisions, to say yes or no, I don't want to feel better, to say yes or no, I don't want to take medication, and I am giving that to my agent. If I'm a 20-year-old, I'm giving that to my mom, to my dad, to my brother. They generally have to understand that concept. If it involves a financial power of attorney, they have to understand that they're, they're giving the authority for someone to make financial decisions for them. And generally, Judge Odd has said that they also have to understand the nature of the assets that they have. And this is a concept that we oftentimes hear in sort of the testamentary capacity, um, which is, you know, I, I get you know, maybe I, I don't under appreciate what $700 is, but I know I get 700 and change a month from Social Security. Someone tells me that. And I know that I'm comfortable with my mom handling that. Or I know that if I have money and I go to the grocery store and I give them money, I might not be able to count it or add it or do the math properly. But I know if I have a dollar bill and I take it to the grocery store, I can get some bread or some gum. And I am giving my mother or my parent the ability to use my money to get that gum for me. It does that. That's as, as simple as it, as it has to be. And in terms of the financial power of attorney, you will we'll see that there is what's called an important statutory notice, which is the, the sort of the front page of a financial power of attorney that must accompany every financial power of attorney in Pennsylvania in order to be binding, so that banks and third parties can rely on it. Judge Odd has also said that an individual has to understand that statutory notice. Um, and again, the statutory notice, it's, it's in a, a statutorily mandated form, um, and it contains well, legalese, it contains legal words, but it has to understand, look, you're giving your mom the ability to use your money to buy you groceries, to get what needs to be done, but you understand if your mom steals that money, if she doesn't use it to buy you groceries, then your mom can no longer use your money. Somebody else is gonna have to step in. And as long as a client can understand that, I think that that meets the standard. And one of the things that, that's, you know, I oftentimes discuss with clients is they come and this is, you know, it's both contexts. Sometimes it's, children bringing their elderly parent to me saying, we, you know, we need to have a power of attorney sign. One's not in place or it's not broad enough. You know, do you think that mom or dad has the capacity to sign it? Uh, oftentimes it's also parents coming to me saying my child has just turned 18 or my child who's 24, we now have a hiccup. We can't, you know, get the medical records or we need something to do with the bank and we don't have the authority. So they're bringing their child to me and saying, does this person have capacity? Um, and, uh, you know, capacity, someone is presumed to have capacity. And under the legal standards that we operate under, attorneys are guided by our ethical rules to basically treat a client that might have diminished capacity just like any other client. So, you know, even though I may know that someone has diminished capacity because of a medical diagnosis or low IQ or whatever it may be, I'm supposed to treat that client as normally as possible. And I'm supposed to make accommodations for them. If, it, if that means that, you know, 
know, they're only really good on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 10 and noon, that's when I should try to see them. And if I meet them once and it's not a good time, try again when perhaps they can, they can be a little bit more um, communicative. Uh, that means that, you know, I, they may need to have certain people in the room to make them feel more comfortable or certain settings. Maybe we meet at the home um, or the park rather than in my office, which is, you know, for some people, maybe an intimidating place, not a fun place. But we're supposed to try to make accommodations and treat people with diminished capacity just as we would any other client. Um, and it's only a court, ultimately, you know, based on medical evidence that determines that someone does or does not have capacity. So I can't be the final arbiter of whether someone has capacity. I can say, you know, I have to, following our ethical rules, say, do I feel that this person has, you know, in my mind, the ability to understand the nature of the authority they are granted, they are being granted. And if I do, I may say that I think this individual could sign a power of attorney. Now, there could be another attorney that could disagree and say, well, I wouldn't be comfortable having a client sign this. Or I might say, I'm not comfortable, but another attorney would be. Um, even if I am comfortable and I think this individual understands the nature of the authority, my decision isn't binding. You know, a court could disagree with me. Likewise, we could have a power of attorney signed and it could be taken to a bank or to a healthcare provider and they may say, no, we're not willing to accept this because maybe the healthcare provider has some medical information or the, the bank has some, you know, sus some reason to suspect what's going on. And there are, there are statutory ways to deal with that, but ultimately it's the court. And, and, and it's also the, the third parties that are relying upon these power of attorney instruments. Um, so, you know, that, that's sometimes I think a question I often get from parents. My, my son or daughter's turned 18. Do we need guardianship or do we need power of attorney? And it is very much, you know, a gray area. And, and I recently sat for my certified elder law attorney exam. And as part of that, a, a huge chunk of that, that, that exam and that body of, of sort of law and area of practice focuses on capacity and diminished capacity and the role of attorneys as advocates. And one of the things that I was, I was very re sort of relieved by in, in some of the, the commentary is that the attorney should, you know, the attorney has to make a risk assessment. Does the attorney think that the person understands the nature of the authority being granted? But the attorney also has a sort of an advocacy role. And the attorney also has to say, what is the risk here? Um, and if there is greater risk that, you know, even if I think, yeah, I think this person understands, but what is the underlying risk? And, and that was, to me was relieving because I oftentimes and more comfortable when a parent comes to me and says, my 18-year-old child with um, you know, Downs needs to sign a power of attorney. We meet maybe a couple times, and I think we can do it. Um, versus when you know, a, the 60-year-old brings 90-year-old dad to me who's, you know, who's on oxygen, who seems to be out of it, who didn't know he was coming to the doctor's office. And to me, sort of, there's just a gut instinct, maybe a red flag. Something doesn't seem right about that. And you know, there, there's no law on this, but the, under, the ethical opinions of neighbors are really you need to assess the potential risk and what is the, the risk are the third parties that are being appointed as agent you know likely to act in the best interest what are the assets that are at stake what are the financial decisions or the healthcare decisions that are at stake so that's a little bit of my sort of sort of my insight there for whatever it may be worth um, and that's the standard to sign a power of attorney in Pennsylvania now that that was sort of financial power of attorney. There is technically um, a a definition under the healthcare power of attorney statute, which talks about whether someone is competent, presumably competent to sign a document, and that that is when someone understands the potential benefits, risks, and alternatives involved in the healthcare decision. They could make that healthcare decision on their own and they could communicate that decision. Now, again, this, this is the potential material benefits. This doesn't mean you have to understand you know, the, the, the risks of infection or reoccurrence from, of surgery A or B, but you have to understand if you get this surgery, it could save your leg versus it couldn't. And the risk of the surgery is that it might not go well. And if someone could say, yes, I understand, I want to save my leg, they can communicate that, then they are competent. And in theory, they are also competent to sign a healthcare power of attorney or proxy. And it's interesting because the, the statutory definition of competent makes it very clear that the term competent, it, it's not, it, it's not plenary. It's, it can be 
it can be as to certain decisions, but not others. And if the statute expressly says that the term is intended to permit individuals to be found competent to make some healthcare decisions, but incompetent as to others. Um, so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. Again, not, nothing is sort of black and white in terms of capacity or competency. So I wanted to talk about um, a, a sort of the gray area, which is this concept of supported decision making. Um, and if you're involved in the, the sort of the disability, the mental health community, you may be familiar with this, this, this word. It's sort of a, a, a buzzword that, that's really in the last five or so years, I think, come to the forefront. Um, and supported decision making is this concept whereby persons with disabilities or cognitive limitations are encouraged to retain their decision-making capacity so that they themselves are making the decisions about their lives. Um, and the support of decision-making, it's, it's not, you know, I'm going to appoint an agent who's going to make the decision for me, or I'm going to have a court appointed guardian and the guardian makes the decision, it's yes, I have a disability or some functional co cognitive limitation, but I still, I still know what I like, I know what I want to do, um, but, but maybe I, I have some limitation. And the concept is that despite my limitations or my disabilities, I, with the, my support team, am able to, to, to be be informed about the pros and the cons and to be sort of guided so that I can make an informed decision that is in my best interest but also consistent with my wishes. Um, and supported decision making, it came, you know, it came about probably about seven or so years ago and there was one particular case that came out of Virginia, I believe, involving Jenny Hatch who was a, a woman with Down syndrome who was under a court-appointed guardianship by which I believe her parents were her guardians and they had her living in a group home um, that, you know, according to the literature I've read was very restrictive and, you know, she, people couldn't come and go, she couldn't come and go, she couldn't associate with the people that she wanted to, she couldn't have a job that she wanted to. And so she had an attorney who then challenged that guardianship. And the, the, the gist of the challenge was basically, look, you know, Jenny, yeah, she has some limitations, but if Jenny has a support team who can guide her, Jenny can make these decisions on her own. Her parents shouldn't be unilaterally imposing their will upon Jenny's life. Jenny should be involved. And the one thing I'll just sort of say out first is the way our guardianship statute works is even, the, you know, a guardian, even though the guardian might be making the decision, the guardian is always supposed to consider the incapacitated person's th wishes, not only their best widget, their best interest, but also their wishes. And, and that's where I think there sometimes is a conflict because, you know, I could be incapacitated. My wish may be to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Is that in my best interest? Absolutely not, but that is my wish. And if that's what I wanna do, I should be able to do that because guardianships are not about necessarily stopping people from making bad decisions. Um, and, and so it, long story short, in this case, Jenny was successful in her challenge and ultimately it was determined that she could make you know, these decisions and have the guardianship be less restrictive with this concept of supported decision-making. Some states have adopted um, you know, legislative framework for the supported decision-making concept. In other states, there are supported decision-making contracts that are entered into. But I think supported decision-making, if we sort of take a step back, is something that all of us are probably doing, regardless of any disability or incapacity in our daily lives. You know, I may have a friend who's thinking about refinancing her mortgage. She might ask me if I've done this before. She might ask her financial professional. She might ask her neighbor. And they support her in making that decision. And if we sort of just refine that a little bit and think about our special needs loved ones, you know, even if they're under 18 or over 18, you know, we might say, you know, look, you have the decision to have this medication versus this medication. And, 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 you know, I might, in my mind, think that it should be a medication A, but we're able to say, look, you know, medication A is going to, you know, probably get you the best result, but here are the things that are the problem. It's going to make you drowsy. You know, it, it's going to have these side effects. And we, we guide them into making that decision. We're not making it for them, but we're sort of propping them up and sort of getting them on the right track. So I think a lot of us are already engaging in supported decision making um, with our special needs loved ones on a, on a regular basis. And so I don't know that the concept is anything new. It just now sort of has a, a, a term and it, it has a, a sort of a, 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 a 
a life of its own. And the supported, and you know, there's no necessarily set the supported decision making team. It's there's not a statutory framework. It's not your your parents and your doctor. For every individual, I think it would be different. And it's generally going to be maybe certain family members, certain friends, certain healthcare providers, you know, certain your certain financial or legal professionals, religious figures, community figures, they could all make up someone's su supported decision making team. And that team may evolve. It might change as a person's needs change. And I think the beauty of that is just as we all kind of might do anyway with our special needs loved ones or our elderly parents, you know, we all kind of work together as a community to get that person on the right track to make sure that they're doing well. But if for some reason they go off track, and the supported decision making team isn't working because one of the supporting persons is taking advantage of manipulating the situation and using you know their influence to the de the detriment of the person who needs the support or the person who needs the support just isn't listening to it and is is going in an area that that, that's that's not in his or her best interest you know they be then we consider guardianship and but the, the thought is we start with this supported decision making and when we get to the guardianship statute we'll see that guardianship is supposed to be the um you know the 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 last resort it's supposed to be the last thing that we go to we always want to start with what is least restrictive and so we want to have supported decision making we want to try to have a power of attorney in place and we only want to go to guardianship and take away someone's rights and determine them to be incapacitated when that really is you know the the the, the only thing left that we can do in order to protect this person so I want to talk quickly about, um, you know, who should be appointed as agent. So this is, again, you know, I, I am signing a power of attorney. My 18-year-old son is signing a power of attorney. Who should he or she appoint as agent? Um, it could be an individual um, or it could be a corporate fiduciary. Um, a corporate fiduciary could be a bank or a trust company. They're typically only going to serve if it's a financial situation where they're managing money. But there are certain corporations like nonprofits, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if Achieva serves as agent, but there are certain other nonprofits that will serve as agents, healthcare agents, to, to make decisions for people. Um, there also could be family versus an independent party. Is it good to appoint your brother or your sister, or maybe should we be appointing someone, you know, a friend or an accountant? Um, you can have different healthcare and financial agents. They don't have to be the same people. And in fact, in some instances, it can be good to have a different person making healthcare decisions than the person making financial decisions, simply because the person that, you know, might be good with numbers is doesn't understand the medicine or it doesn't seem to have as big of a heart and you wouldn't want them to make the decisions. And also having different people in those roles can serve as a check and balance. Um, you know, also if we have a situation where there's, an, you know, a, a family dynamic like a, a divorce or some other, you know, family discord, we might want to think about should we have co-agents? Will those co-agents work? Are we better off using a disinterested third party, whether it be an independent friend or some sort of a corporate fiduciary? And what's very important important is when we're talking about these agents, we always want to make sure that there are backup successor or alternate agents appointed. Um, so, you know, if I'm doing my power of attorney, I may appoint my husband, um, but if he can't serve, you know, right now my children are minors, so I might appoint my sister. But if I do this power of attorney now and don't look at it again for you know, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but let's just say a long time. Uh, you know, maybe my husband has predeceased me. My sister may be incapacitated. If I have it named a third agent and I'm incapacitated, that power of attorney instrument doesn't do me any good. So you want to name a succession of people, some of whom are, are typically a, a, a generation or two below, or maybe name a corporate um, agent as a backup so that you always have some, someone in place so that that power of attorney instrument can remain operative. Um, and the, you know, and we're, so we think about this, talking about our special needs loved ones. Let's say I'm working with clients that are coming to me and we're appointing, you know, agents for their now adult child who has special needs. Typically the parents jointly are going to be the initial agents. We might appoint the siblings as the backup agents. And we, you know, or maybe before the siblings, we do aunt or uncle or grandparents, but we always want to make sure that we have enough. And it's always important that we really think carefully about who these agents are. Just because someone is appointed as agent doesn't mean that they have to serve. They can always decline to serve, but we want to make sure that the agents we are appointing are 
people who are responsible and trustworthy. Um, and if you've ever heard me speak before on this topic, I'm sure I've said this and I give great credit to him. He was, he's a wonderful man, but Judge Lucchino, who used to be our uh, president judge of Orphans Court, would, would always say that if Jesse James back in his day had a power of attorney instrument, he wouldn't have needed a gun. And Judge Lucchino said that because he probably has seen so many horrific cases where the agents under financial powers of attorney or maybe even healthcare have ended up, you know, abusing their principal, you know, not getting them the care they need, wiping out their finances, mishandling the money. And so that's why you need to be very thoughtful. And if you personally don't have a good individual that you can appoint or for your child, if you, you know, your family is very small and it's you and it's your mother. And if it's neither of you, there's no one else, then think about, you know, a, a corporate um, such as Achieva or another entity that might be willing to serve. But having those successor alternates is always very, very important. We talked about the types of powers of attorney. Um, they can be springing, mean, meaning that they only take effect when something happens, such as I'm out of the country for a month, often it's when I become incapacitated, or they can be effective immediately. Typically, the healthcare power of attorneys are drafted to be springing in the sense that the healthcare agent's authority only kicks in if the principal doesn't have the capacity to make the, mental deci the medical decision. Whereas a financial power of attorney, particularly if you're doing this for a, a special needs child who's now 18, typically you want that to be effective immediately. You don't want it to be effective upon incapacity because you would like to be able to step in and help your, your now adult child, even though he or she is still able to participate in, in the affairs. And that can be a lot um, easier. And that way you don't need to actually show because if it's springing and effective only upon incapacity, before the agent's authority is triggered, you need to get medical notes that say this person lacks the, the, the ability to make decisions. And that adds an extra time and expense. Um, we always want to make sure that the powers of attorney say that they're durable, but by statute, they typically are unless you, you draft around that. And we want to include broad enough powers. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about the distinction between these health care powers of attorney and mental health care. When we look at the definition under the statute, and it's chapter 54 that governs health care powers of attorney, chapter 58 that governs mental health care powers of attorney, health care in chapter 54, as you'll see, it, it, it defines um, any care, treatment, service, or procedure to maintain, diagnose, treat, or provide for physical or mental health. And there's some typos in there, please exclude, excuse those, but me, it, you know, clearly it includes mental health. We also have a chapter that addresses mental health care powers of attorney that talks about any care, treatment, service, or procedure to maintain, diagnose, or treat mental health, including medication program or therapeutical treatment. And we see medication programs and therapeutic treatment are also in the health care section. So oftentimes there is an overlap and the health care power of attorney in place is going to enable the healthcare agent to make mental health decisions because just by definition, under the statute, healthcare includes mental health, therapeutic um, procedures and treatment. Now there is a big distinction uh, because when we when we'll, we'll get to a slide on this, but one of the big distinctions is the mental health care chapter talks about ECT treatment and um, psychiatric residential facilities, and so that's one of the big distinctions. And if you have a loved one who has mental health issues, you want to make sure that that health care mental health care power of attorney if that's what the individual wants, is drafted broadly enough to include the authorization of ECT and admission discharge to certain treatment facilities and maybe even certain experimental treatments. Um, you know, I've had some clients that have been, you know, before it was legal in Pennsylvania for medicinal purposes, they had some adult children with disabilities that they were enrolling in special medical marijuana treatment programs um, out of state. And we needed to make sure that the document was broad enough to offer that. Um, so you just you need to think about what types of treatment might this person need, and if particularly in the mental health care context, make sure that it's drafted broadly enough if in fact that's what the principal wants. I mentioned earlier that there are also these health care um, de declarations or, you know, advanced directives. Um, and we're going to talk about those as well. And, and one is an advanced directive, also known as a living will for healthcare. This is the document that's the statement of someone's wishes in the event that they are incompetent, 
and they're either suffering from an end stage condition or they're permanently unconscious. So this is not, I'm incapacitated because I'm in a medically induced coma while they treat me, but I'm expected to make a full recovery. This is, I am incapacitated and I have, you know, I have, you know, 90% loss of my brain function. I am in an end stage terminal condition. I have stage four cancer and I have you know, days left to live, weeks left to live. And in this case, I am able to sign this advanced directive or this living will that is a statement of what I would like to have. And this is oftentimes the, the, the document that you know, sort of pulls the plug or says, look, I want my agent, either I direct my agent or I want my agent to be able to, you know, remove hydration by tube, remove feeding by tube. You know, if they deter, you know, if I, if I have, um, you know, some sort of very degenerative disease, MS is, is, is got me and they realize that I have toe cancer, I don't want them to treat my toe cancer because my MS is going to, you know, it's going to take my life sooner. So why treat the toe cancer? This is that document. Um, and, it, it, and these are important because it can be either a directive, meaning that the healthcare providers and agents must follow it, or it can merely be an expression of wishes that, that you wish for the agent to consider. There is also a mental health declaration, which is similar to an advanced directive, but this is an expression of an individual's wishes and instructions when they need certain mental health care and when they are incapable of making their mental health decisions. This really applies when someone is, a, is in a psychiatric treatment facility. Um, again, they can't make the decision themselves and they are in a psychiatric treatment facility or we're talking about admission or discharge. And oftentimes, you know, the, and there's a wonderful statutory form, but it talks about the use of ECT, experimental studies and drug trials. And unlike an advanced directive, which is typically binding until it's revoked by the individual, the mental health declaration that would govern the, the um, psychiatric treatment facilities, ECT, et cetera, it is generally only valid for two years once signed. So it needs to effectively be renewed. However, if the individual becomes incapacitated, you know, within the two-year period of signing it, it then remains valid during that period of capacity until the, the principal is again able. So this is a mental health declaration. Um, for advanced directives, these living wills and mental health declarations, an individual generally needs to be over 18 or emancipated for mental health. For health care, the statute also allows the individual to be under 18 or have graduated from high school. Um, so generally speaking, it, it's over 18 or emancipated. It has to be signed by the individual and dated. Uh, an individual can sign by mark. I have clients that have lost the use of both of their hands and they are able to hold a pen and make a line. That is fine as long as people have witnessed them doing that. An individual can also direct another person to sign on his or her behalf. So if I cannot even hold that pen, but I am able to verbalize, to my, you know, the, my person in the hospital bed next to me or to my mother, I want you to sign this document for me. As long as that is witnessed, I can direct my mother to sign on my behalf and date on my behalf. So it must be signed and dated by the declarant or someone acting by their behalf. It must be witnessed by two individuals who are over 18, neither of whom is signing on behalf. So if I'm directing my mom to sign, she can't also witness. It should also not generally be witnessed by someone who is providing healthcare services for me. Um, it, it can be witnessed by someone who may be named as the healthcare agent. That's okay, not ideal, but okay. And notary is likewise not required. So it, it's ideally, if you're doing this in a law office, you're probably going to have it notarized, but it doesn't need to be. And so particularly under these, these crazy COVID circumstances, this is a document that you can do with just witnesses without the need to have a notary. Um, we talked about the distinctions between those documents. I mentioned this concept of, you know, statutory healthcare representatives. This, and I'm just going to tell you when this kicks in. This, again, is when someone does not have a health care power of attorney. They do not have a guardian. Um, and they, it, it applies to, you know, health care when they have an end-stage medical condition or they are permanently unconscious. So this is really sort of end-of-life decisions for someone who doesn't have a guardian or an agent under a health care power of attorney. Um, and these are some of the statutory terms. I'm not going to get into those, but what the, the statute does, it says if someone is in that end stage condition, they don't have a legal representative appointed, the statute appoints a health care representative for them. It's going to be the spouse, unless there are a divorce pending, or there are also children who are not children of the spouse, an adult child, 
a parent, an adult brother or sister, an adult grandchild, and this is what I mentioned before, any adult who has knowledge of the individual's preferences and values. Uh, generally, it's not going to be a healthcare provider unless the healthcare provider is related to the individual. And these are the statutory sections regarding what a statutory healthcare representative can do. I'm just gonna let you look at those on your own if you would like to. Chapter 56 of our PEF code governs financial powers of attorney. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these documents. I think you hopefully got the gist of it, but with our financial powers of attorney, we've recently made some changes, um, effective 2015, some on other dates, that have really tightened up the requirements, the execution requirements for financial powers of attorney. And the reason is because there had been so much abuse of these documents. The agents appointed um, were taking advantage of the principles. You know, a lot of the, the AG's office has a, a unit dedicated to this. A lot of the county DAs now have sort of elder abuse units. So this is a real problem. Um, and so because of this, the execution requirements for our financial power of attorney in Pennsylvania are actually more restrictive or more onerous than they are for a will. A power of attorney, in, a financial power of attorney, in order to be valid, has to be signed by the principal, again, signature or mark, you can direct someone else to sign on your behalf, but it also must be notarized by two individuals who are not persons named in the document, so who are not agents that are appointed, and who also are not a notary, that's notarizing the document and it must be notarized. So this is a document that, that for clients right now that are trying to do planning, that we, we do have to have a notary on these financial powers of attorney right now. So, and there are, there are currently some um, orders that would allow for remote notarization, but you know, a lot of attorneys are still scrambling because the requirements to do that are, are not really clear. Um, so we've had, you know, I, I've had some people in my office and a number of uh, peers who have actually, you know, gone, they've done, you know, um, driveway executions, they've done drive, drive by executions, that doesn't sound right, but where the client will pull up to the office and, you know, they'll go on the trunk of the car, they'll, they'll sign the documents wearing masks and gloves. So, but this is a document that must be notarized. A will ideally would be notarized in PA, but doesn't have to be. Um, but a financial power of attorney does have to be. The financial power of attorney also has to have the statutory notice, which I mentioned earlier, which is at the front of the document, and also an agent acknowledgement. Before the agent's authority is triggered, the agent has to sign this acknowledgement, indicating that the agent understands you know, the powers given and agrees to effectively act in the best interest. Um, under financial powers of attorney, the powers that the principal grants are very important. And there are certain powers that if they're not expressly included in the power of attorney instrument, the agent doesn't have them. And these are powers that can be really important for special needs individuals, disabled individuals, or elderly people, because they often involve some sort of estate or sort of disability or public benefits planning. One of the powers that must be expressly included is to make actions, take actions with regards to trust, in revivos trust. If I wanted to, you know, my son who's disabled and is 20 comes into money, my mother leaves him money, she doesn't plan it properly, he's going to get $20,000, it's going to kick him off his SSI and his medical assistance. Uh, you know, I can't, and if he's incapacitated, if I'm his agent, I can't create a special needs trust on his behalf unless that power has been included in the power of attorney instrument that he previously signed before he was incapacitated. So you got to make sure that these hot powers are in there. They're called hot powers, I guess, if you will not a legal term. Uh, that also includes making gifts. And gifting is another area that in order to enable the agent to make gifts, it has to be expressly in the document and described exactly how those gifts are going to be, be made. So these are some of the hot powers and, and the two three biggest ones that I think need to be addressed in a special needs planning context are to take action regarding inter vivos trusts, to make gifts, and to change beneficiary designations. Um, here, we, this is the statutory section regarding gifting, and generally speaking, with under the new power of attorney law, the agent doesn't have any authority to make gifts unless the principal grants the agent authority to make gifts. And if the principal does say, my agent can make gifts in the document, it is limited to what we call limited gifting, which is in the amount of the federal annual gift exclusion for gift tax purposes, which is $15,000 for this year. So it's, it's very, it's, it's a, a rather small amount if we need to do some uh, fancy planning. So in order to enable the principal to make unlimited gifts, that must be included in the document. Um, so 
you know, before, you, you know, when you're doing a power of attorney, you know, I, and I've seen people pull them offline and it just doesn't comply with the execution requirements or the formalities under PA law. You got to make sure that it's properly executed. You have the statutory notice, you have the agent, agent acknowledgement, it's signed and dated, witnessed by two independent witnesses and notarized. We need to have the agent accepting the, the signature page and we need to make sure that the agent authority is triggered before the agent can act. So is it a springing versus effective immediately? And we need to make sure that the agent's authority under the document is broad enough to do what needs to be done or what may need to be done. Um, we always want to think about whether the agent appointed is suitable. Are we naming, you know, enough agents? We have enough alternate agents, and do we have enough broad powers in the documents? So I want to transition now into court-appointed guardians for incapacitated adults. Um, and uh, so here, this is again for an adult, someone who's over 18, who lacks the capacity to sign a power of attorney. Um, or who may have had capacity to sign one, but now doesn't. Um, it can also be, as I mentioned, where there's a dispute over a, a existing power of attorney documents or the agent's authority. So there's battles of the powers of attorney, questions as to capacity. You know, the, the doctor, one doctor says the principal lacks capacity, so the agent's springing that power should be triggered. Another doctor says, no, principal has capacity. It's not triggered. What do we do? We go to the court and the court decides. Um, so that's where we might have a court appointed uh, guardian. The guardianship process. So, you know, power of attorney to sign that, you know, you go to, gen you can go, you can do it online, but generally you go to an attorney's office, you tell them what you need, they, they talk to you about what should be included, who should the agents be, they prepare a form. And, you know, it's, it's maybe a phone call and a one or two meetings where you actually sign the power of attorney document. The guardianship process is much more involved. This is where an interested person, uh, and any interested person may do it, um, may petition the court for the appointment of a guardian. So a guardianship petition must be filed, and the statute is very clear as to what has to be in there. You have to include the incapacitated person's, you know, their, their, their date of birth, their address, where they live, what their diagnosis is. You have to include their next of kin, certain treatment providers. Generally, you're going to also identify the proposed guardian. You're going to say who you think should be the guardian. And we've had some pretty drastic changes to our guardianship statute, again, all under the guise of protecting our Pennsylvania citizens, that now require that the proposed guardian undergo background checks. Um, and this was as a result of some, some pretty bad actors in the eastern part of the state, where actually there was a, a guardian service agency, or a woman who was running it, who was appointed as guardian by a couple of courts in the eastern part of the state for a number of individuals. And lo and behold, one of the family members of these individuals uh, suspected her of mishandling funds. Tried to bring it to the court's attention. I don't think it worked. Ultimately found out that this woman who had been appointed, who was running this guardian service agency, actually had had, I, th I think, like fraud or theft convictions, some conviction of moral turpitude that would make you not want to have that individual serve as guardian in another state. I think she had them in New Jersey. So finally, you know, the, the court addresses this, removes this individual, tries to make everyone whole. But of course, you know, they, they, they identified a real potential gap in the system. And so now, in, in order to protect the incapacitated persons, you've got to have these background checks. Um, it can be done pretty easily. There's a, a Pennsylvania State Police portal. If you've lived out of state within, I think, five years of, of the proposed appointment, you have to go to that state's state police registry as well. Um, and I, I, you know, so if you're having a third party, you know, a guardianship agency, you might think, yeah, that makes sense. We want them to have background checks. But I've, I've heard, you know, some people say, well, why do I have to, you know, I'm, I'm little Johnny's mother, he's now 18, why in the world would I have to get a background check? This seems onerous. And it may seem onerous, but the reality is, if you don't have a criminal history, the check is, is I think it's $15 or so, and it comes back right away. Even if you have a criminal history, that doesn't mean that you can't be guardian. It just has to be disclosed to the court so that the court is aware. And I, I've had a lot of clients. I have one right now in Mercer County where the mother, you know, back in the day when she was young and, and silly, she, you know, she had some 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 charges, you know, involving some substance abuse and some other things. But those were all 
15 years ago, um, you know, and, and the court appointed her as guardian because she has been the one that's been advocating for her disabled now adult son all of his life. Um, so you file this petition with the, the court. The attorney needs to get a, you know, all the background information to do this. The petition is filed. Generally, the judge then sets a hearing date about 45 days out, and it will depend based on the, the county how it will play out. Um, the, in, they'll set a hearing date, they'll also enter a citation, which is a citation directed to the incapacitated person, the alleged incapacitated person, that says, you know, a petition has been filed seeking to have you declared as incapacitated, you know, that petition is attached, this is going to be heard by the court on whatever date. It lets them know that they have the right to an attorney, to counsel, and the right to attend a hearing. Um, one of the big things that's being discuss now in, in the advocacy groups is whether it should be mandatory for the alleged incapacitated person to have counsel. Uh, some counties or judges handle this differently, and there's some counties or judges where, as a matter of course, they will appoint counsel for the incapacitated person because they feel that that person should be represented. And, it, you know, I've, I've seen it compared to uh, you know, public defenders. If, if someone has a criminal charge, they are entitled to be defended in that. And in incapacity proceeding, it is seeking to take away someone's rights to declare them incapacitated. So, you know, I think a lot of the advocacy does make sense. Why shouldn't someone have the benefit of counsel? There might not be any basis to challenge it. The person might, you know, even if they can understand a bit what's going on, they might not challenge it, but that still is a pretty significant thing that's happening. Um, in my experience, traditionally, I've seen judges appoint counsel where they have some sort of question where the, the guardianship is contested or something about it just causes the judge to have some concern so they want counsel for the incapacitated person. Um, what will then generally happen is there's typically um, a deposition of a medical professional in advance of the hearing either by telephone or by written deposition because again the judge is the one that determines incapacity but the judge does that based on medical evidence and at the hearing the judge takes that medical testimony um, will hear from counsel for the parties and then we'll typically you know, sort of interview or ask some questions under oath of the proposed guardians on the stand to know if they are suitable. So the hearings are pretty, you know, typically straightforward, short and to the point, unless it is a contested guardianship, unless two siblings are fighting about who should be guarding for dad, or mom is contesting the guardianship that son has filed saying that she doesn't need one. That is the guardianship uh, process. The standard for incapacity, uh, the standard in Pennsylvania is an adult whose ability to receive and evaluate information effectively and communicate decisions is in any way impaired to such a significant extent that he or she is partially or totally unable to manage his or her financial resources or to meet essential requirements for physical health and safety. That's what a doctor needs to say, that this individual's ability to receive and evaluate information and communicate effectively is significantly impaired. How impaired will determine if it's a partial guardianship or a partial incapacity, a limited guardianship, or a total incapacity a or a plenary guardianship, as we discussed early. And I, going back to that concept of supported decision making, we talked about how you know guardianship is supposed to be the least resort. And if we see, if we look at the statutory section, it says that they're supposed to enable people's rights and their well-being to be met through the use of the least restrictive alternatives. And in addition, the incapacitated person is supposed to participate as fully as possible in all decisions with effect, which affect them. So we can see that we would like the concept of supported decision making. Um, and if we can't have the supported decision making, then even if there is a guardian, that guardian should involve the incapacitated person. And what the incapacitated person wants might not, you know, sort of objectively be in the person's best interest and you need to, to balance that. That can be very difficult. Um, generally, who can be appointed as a guardian? It could be any individual or corporate fiduciary, a nonprofit or a guardianship support agency. Again, we now have, you know, some restrictions with the, um, the need to have the, the police reports. So the court will make a finding of incapacity. We talked about limited versus plenary guardian, guardian of the person, guardian of the estate. Um, these, these slides just give you some of the statutory language if you'd like to refer to them. Um, and again, if someone is partially incapacitated, they still retain some rights, but not those rights that the court has taken away. Totally incapacitated, they are incapable of making a contract or gift or making really any decisions. They can participate in them, but it's the guardian that's ultimately, ultimately making them. 
Two questions that always come up are voting and marriage. Uh, can someone who's been adjudicated to be incapacitated vote? Uh, and this is a state by state inquiry because voting is a state thing. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, there is no constitutional disqualification provision simply because someone is adjudicated. And in fact, anyone who is over 21 uh, who has been a citizen for the requisite time is, is able to vote. And there are even certain, you know, statutory provisions for persons who reside at institutions for mental health issues and their ability to vote. So, you know, we, we have some attorney general's opinions. It's very clear. Yes, you can still vote. Um, can any capacitated person get married? And, you know, I'm not the family law person, but my understanding uh, based on the reading of the statute is, is in, in a couple cases I've been involved in is yes, unless there's a court order that would prohibit it, prohibit it. Under the guardian of the person's statutory section, the guardian of the person cannot prohibit someone from getting married or someone being the incapacitated person from getting married or cannot consent to their divorce without court approval. So I think the answer is yes, unless the court has chimed in. Um, and a family law practitioner might take a, a different you know, view on that. Marriage is a contract. Technically, you're not supposed to be able to get into a contract if you're totally incapacitated. Um, I have not seen that issue come up, but I have seen situations where someone was married before the guardianship and the guardian needed to get court approval for that divorce process. Um, generally, the guardianship is brought in the, the county in which the incapacitated person is domiciled or if they're in a facility where that facility is, so basically where they are residing. Um, you know, here's some, some basics if you want to look at it. Who can be a permissible petitioner for guardianship? Any interested person. Um, there, there can be a guardianship for someone who has property in PA but who isn't physically here. There is the, the ability to have an emergency guardian appointed that, that sort of um, expedites and bypasses the typical statutory notice period if there could be irreparable harm to that person's in, uh, their, their being or their finances. A court-appointed guardian does have to do annual reporting to the court. And this is where some people might say that's onerous, that's burdensome. But it also, you know, provides sort of a safety net because someone is looking at these reports. And as we're going to see, there is now a guardianship tracking system that is designed to streamline these reports to make sure that there is one master database where they are entered. And that guardianship tracking system in Harrisburg is supposed to tip off the individual county offices if there is an irregularity in the report. So it's basically help the counties monitor these. Um, the guardian of the estate will file a report regarding the, you know, the money that's been received, spent, invested, the expenditures and the person's needs. Guardian of the person will we'll talk about where the incapacitated person lives, medical issues, changes, um, you know, whether there's any need for the guardianship to change and how often they visited. visited. In addition, within 60 days of the incapacitated person passing away or a termination or some sort of modification of the type of guardianship, the guardian has to file a final report. The statute only requires a final report, but in some counties like Pennsylvania, in Allegheny County, um, the, the court rules for Allegheny actually require a final accounting, which is a more formal, formal document that goes through the audit process. Um, there needs to be notice to the Commonwealth if someone is in a, a state institution or receiving public benefits of an incapacity proceeding. Uh, in addition, there, with the changes to the guardianship rules, the persons providing certain residential services and other health care for service providers need to have notice of the proposed guardianship. Again, a guardian has to file an accounting in certain instances. These statutory sections that I'm showing you now talk about how the guardian of the estate can use the, the funds. And generally speaking, the court order dictates what the guardian can do, but if the court order is silent, any use of principle for the incapacitated person must be approved by court. You can do what you want to do with income, but any principle must first ask, you ask the court for permission to spend it. Um, in addition, if it, the guardian wants to do estate planning for the incapacitated person, like create trusts, fund trusts, you know, enter into certain contracts, advanced court approval needs to be obtained under Section 5536. Um, there is a uniform guardianship act. If, if you have someone who, you know, there was a guardianship in PA and, and then dad moves the person to Ohio, there's some, some law that attempts to address that that's beyond the scope of today. And lastly, before we get into questions, I just want to talk about some of these significant changes to the guardianship rules in order to better protect our Pennsylvania residents and sort of uniform and streamline the system. 
The annual guardian of the report of person and state forms have been revised. They're broader, they're standardized, and they are now filed online by this guardianship tracking system, um, which carries over information from previous years and makes it easier for the court to identify discrepancies in the filing. There is an additional notice to certain people um, of the guardianship and of the annual reports as required by court order. And again, one of the big changes is this qualification and background check. Um, proposed guardians must submit a criminal background check and advise on what qualifications they have. And those qualifications now are potential training. Um, and the rules contemplate that, that each county will come up with a training process for court appointed guardians. Because the, the, I, you, know, you just saw some of the statutory sections, they are dense, they are, they, they're, it's legal. How would I know that I need to go to court before I spend principal? And you know, ideally the attorney would tell you when you're appointed, but I might tell you in an office visit or a letter, well, you're dealing with a hundred other things in addition to your incapacitated loved one, you're gonna forget that. And, and so the, the courts have decided the legislature has decided that training is really important. And so some of this training is done on the GTS system. Some, some counties are requiring a more formal training and that's still very much uh, in a state of flux. And then lastly, we do have this guardianship tracking system, which is intended to be done online. So I, I let you down because I did not look at questions as this was coming up because they weren't automatically popping up on my screen. And I see now that we have some. So I'm gonna look at those questions quickly and see if I can answer some of them. So one of the first questions is, um, when is a mental health power of attorney needed? And, you know, because the question is many people have disabilities with co-occurring mental health issues. And, you know, I, and differing, you get my th different answers from different people, but I am of the mindset that generally speaking, a healthcare power of attorney is going to be broad enough to take care of the mental health treatment with the, the, the two, the one big exception being the ECT. So if I, and you'd have to look at the form healthcare power of attorney that you're using. Um, our form that we use in our office includes experimental treatments. It includes ECT in our standard healthcare power of attorney. So I think do that does the trick and wouldn't necessarily require a separate mental health power of attorney. I've had some clients that have come to me where we, you know, we, there's, you know, it is a, a mental health situation or there's a specific medical issue that we are dealing with. And we just make sure that all of the lovely language for a mental health power of attorney is included verbatim from the statute in our healthcare power of attorney. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, and is a power of attorney valid if it goes to another state? Uh, you know, it, it should be, and this is, this is sort of a, this, a state issue. Generally, you know, states honor contracts that are entered into in another state. So it, it in theory should be, although obviously you can have some issues. One of the big problems that we oftentimes see, whether in state or out of state, is, you know, they'll say that the power of attorney instrument is old, it's expired, it's more than, you know, two years old, you got to get a new one. Well, no, if you look at the document, it says that it's durable, it, it hasn't been revoked. And in that case, you maybe need to get an affidavit from the agent, uh, or have the attorney write a letter to confirm that it, it still is a valid document. And there's actually statutory authority for failure to honor power of attorney. And there's been some pretty significant cases nationwide if there is financial or personal harm to an individual because that's not considered. Um, someone asked, should anyone, everyone sign a mental health care power of attorney in addition to a regular? I, I am of the opinion that no, I think most healthcare power of attorneys are gonna necessarily include those mental health powers. But if, if you have someone who definitely has a mental health issue and they wanna be specific about you know, um, some psychiatric treatment uh, options, then you might wanna incorporate that into your document and maybe call it a, a healthcare and mental health power of attorney. Like I said, there's not you know, sort of step forms for these, a lot of these documents can be crafted to the individual's need and they can be hybrids. Um, so let's see. Are there financial institutions that will act as agent under a power of attorney? Yes. A lot of the bigger banks, the national banks, um, will sometimes not because it can be 
a regulatory, a compliance issue, it can be perceived as a conflict of interest. But a lot of smaller banks, particularly PA banks or community banks will. In addition, one of the things that I found is a really good trick, and I, and I have to use this for elderly persons, but it, it can be anyone. Let's say you wanted to work with a particular bank, but they won't serve as agent under a power of attorney. Putting assets into a, a trust and then naming that bank as trustee is a good way around that because the, the trust is basically then sort of a, I don't want to say it's a substitute because you should still have the financial power of attorney, but whatever's in trust is going to be controlled by that bank. So that's a good way around that. And I see a lot of clients do that. Um, you mentioned naming successor agents in a POA document. Can guardianship include successor guardians? So that's a good question. And I, that's up to the court. I have seen some courts that will actually enter an order that say Joe is the guardian. If Joe can't serve, Lisa is the guardian. I, I, in most cases, though, I don't see it done that way. And the court will simply appoint one guardian or co-guardians. And only if then there is a vacancy in the office of guardian or there is a changed circumstance, will the court then go back and revisit it. So you could ask a court to do that. I've seen it done. I think that's the exception, not the norm. When I have situations, and I oftentimes have this with you know, special needs children, parents come and they say, you know, we want to be the guardians, but there might be adult siblings. And I oftentimes say, well, why don't we include them? Why don't we have the parents and some or all of the siblings as co-guardians? That way, if parents want to go on a trip to Italy, they don't have to worry about, oh, geez, we get stuck over there. We're, we're sick over there. We can't come back. Now, no one has legal authority over our adult disabled son or adult incapacitated son because there, in fact, have been multiple co-guardians appointed. So while parents are out of the picture, sister has the authority. Or if parents are you know, tragically killed in a car accident, you know, in addition to dealing with that, we're not scrambling into court to get a successor guardian for Jimmy because we already have multiple co-guardians appointed. <clears throat> Does a handwritten will and directive for end stage, which is notarized, have the same val validity? And I would say yes. The, you know, the statute does not require that the advanced directive be typed in any certain form. It just requires that it be an expression of a person's wishes and that it be signed and dated and have two witnesses. So I think it can be handwritten. If it's notarized, you know, that doesn't technically comply with the statute because it talks about witnesses. However, you know, ultimately what you're looking at is the statement of the individual's wishes. And if that goes to a court, a court might say, yes, this isn't technically the form, but this is what Jane Doe wanted. It, it's clear she wrote this, a notary saw her write this and sign it. They're going to probably rely upon that as evidence of the person's intentions, even if for some reason initially the hospital might reject it and say, look, we can't pull the plug because this isn't conforming to our requirements. We could go to a court and use that as evidence of Jane's wishes, and then the court might enter an order authorizing what was being requested. Um, so this is a good question, and I'm kind of taking these out of order, so you have to excuse me, but any advice when an individual in a mental health situation, they revoke the POA? And that's, that's oftentimes a, a tricky situation and one that we see a lot, you know, with mental health issues, with dementia. Um, you know, there's a, so someone has the capacity to sign a POA. They put in place, we think this is great. You know, it names parents, it names brothers, but this person has a mental health issue or maybe they are now being influenced by a girlfriend or by a friend and they revoke that POA and they name someone else, someone who we don't think is doing right by them. Um, you know, that, that is a, an inherent risk if you don't have a guardianship because the principal, as long as he or she has capacity, can always revoke that power of attorney instrument as, a lot, again, as long as they have capacity. So in, in sometimes if I'm dealing with a situation where it's a gray area uh, and you know, we say, look, we, I, there could be supported decision-making for this person, but this person also is very much at risk because of a mental health issue. And right now, they're probably at this moment, for the next six months, they're probably incapacitated. We might instead consider going a guardianship route because then we have a court order that declares that person to be incapacitated that basically is a protective measure. Doesn't mean the court can't change its mind and say Jimmy has regained capacity, amending the guardianship, but it basically means 
because Jimmy cannot sign another power of attorney once that order is entered because his rights have been taken away. So th those are some, those are top mental health cases are, are tough as I know you, you, you probably know firsthand. Uh, but that's, that's one instance where we, we might lean towards a guardianship uh, because we might find it provides a little bit of extra protection. <clears throat> Um, let's see, just give me a moment here as I'm reading these. So the, there's another question uh, regarding whether I think healthcare providers will accept assigned healthcare power of attorney that is not witnessed because of the stay at home rules. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I would think that Technically, they shouldn't, although we, we are, I just was on a call, a probate and trust council call yesterday with in Allegheny County practitioners, and we were talking about going to one of our senators and state reps about having some advocacy to, to, to make the execution requirements a little more lenient. In some instances, they are, they are onerous and they are nearly impossible to comply with under this COVID crisis. So, you know, there, there is a chance that the healthcare power of attorney, um, you know, it, that might be changed by some sort of a directive or, or temporary legislation. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think the healthcare providers, you know, it, it depends what's happening. And I think oftentimes you see this, you know, you'll see that sometimes they're, they're more likely to release certain information or to involve family members than others. Um, and so I think probably in this crisis situation, whether it's legal or right or wrong, you might see a little bit of leniency when it comes to certain involvement of family members or next of kin or sharing of information. That's just my two cents, not sort of a very gray answer, I know. Um, let's see. A question is now, would you address funding for powers of attorney guardianships for families or on fixed income? So this is a great question. You know, you don't, you, you, you know, and, and for people that, that are, have, you know, finite resources, these these things are even more pressing, you know. So there, you know, you can you can download um, forms, statutory financial powers of attorney, healthcare power of attorney forms online. I think a lot of the bar associations and the legal legal um, you know pro bono resources have them. Uh, I, there are also clinics. I know that some nonprofits and other advocacy groups like the Western Pennsylvania Trial Lawyers Association, maybe even Chiva, they've had some clinics where they actually help people get powers of attorney document in place or do guardianships. I know the, the Trial Lawyers Association, I don't know if that ever got off the ground, but, but we were talking about um, you know, pro bono work where we would help people to get guardianship for their, their loved ones. So there are some, you know, neighborhood legal services that may be willing to do that. Um, there are certainly some nonprofits and some other advocacy groups that I think would be willing to consider that. The guardianship process, it's a little bit more time intensive, which I think makes it difficult. But certainly if, you know, if, if you are with a, a provider who has an interest in that, you know, connect with someone like at Achieva or someone like myself, and we can try to see what sort of um, other resources we could pull to perhaps have some sort of similar clinic. Um, and I'll take just, I think, one final question so we can, we can cut off. Let me just, I'm getting a message from my IT guy. Let me make sure I read that. Oh, okay. So other questions in a different area. Um, question, is it better to name just one parent as POA and then name the other as a backup as well as an adult sibling? Um, and I think that really is, is a, it's a family preference, right? Um, I think most of the time, if I'm dealing with parents who have an adult child that we are doing a power of attorney instrument for, we're probably naming the parents jointly. And the document says that parents are encouraged to act together, but the signature of one combined. That way, if dad's on a trip to California or mom's on a trip to New York, you know, we have another parent who's here locally who's able to act. So we don't have to prove that mom is out of the country and, you know, it can be difficult. So I typically think it, it might be better to name two, both parents and then the siblings as backup. But I've seen cases where we've named parents and siblings as all co-agents because parents travel or parents, you know, whatever the case may be. So it's a really fact by fact um, and case specific inquiry. All right, now Greg is telling me that there are other questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna to try to pull that up. And again, I apologize that I'm not tech savvy here. The chat, okay, so how do I get to chat? 
the chat should be down on the bottom for you, Nora. Okay. So you know what? If I end my slide, I think it, it'll pop up. Stop share. Okay. There we go. Chat. Okay. Thank you. All right, here we go. Found it. So here's a question regarding the responsibilities of a facility specific to residential placement um, involving an agent in decision making, uh, providing signatures, copies of documents. So I have a lot more experience with this when it comes to placement in a, a skilled nursing facility or, you know, not, not a residential treatment facility. But I think a lot of the concepts overlap. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, any any facility that accepts public funds, Medicare or Medicaid, it cannot require a guarantee. So, you know, if, if a parent is signing um, for a child, whether it's as agent or they're sort of signing as next of kin, they cannot require a financial guarantee, generally speaking. Now, they can guarantee that the parent as agent agreed to use the child's funds if the child has them, but they can't guarantee that the parent individually um, you know, use his or her funds. So I would always make sure that if a parent is signing for someone or someone, you know, another agent is signing for the principal in, in terms of some sort of placement in a facility, that they are always signing that document in the capacity as agent. So in the representative capacity, in the capacity as guardian. So my name is Nora and my child is, is going into a sort of placement. I'm gonna sign, sign it Nora, agent for child guardian for child, you know, parent for child, because I think that makes it clear, but, but technically they should not be requiring, you know, unless it's some sort of a rehab facility that, that that's exclusively private pay, that's another issue, but uh, they cannot require guarantees. And generally speaking, you know, they're, the residents of, of facilities have rights to access information and where there is an agent, that information should likewise be given to the agent unless the individual has capacity and has said, no, I no longer want my agent to have it. Um, so in the event that a family doesn't have a document in place protecting their adult children in light of this pandemic, what should they take? Well, I think, you know, and this is something that's come up a lot in these estate planning contexts, you know, the, the pandemic has just highlighted the need for people to have this planning in place, but they should have it in place anyway. What I would say is, you know, if, if you have the wherewithal, you know, maybe contact an attorney who could prepare power of attorney instruments. It can be done very simply with, a, you know, by email, with a phone call. We talk about who they're going to appoint, you know, what the pros and cons are. The documents can be exchanged by email or regular mail. Um, and the only one that needs to be notarized, again, is that financial power of attorney. So I think, you know, the, the pandemic is a good time to start thinking about this planning and getting it put in place if it's not already there. Um, oh, where did my chat go? Sorry, guys. Okay, sorry, I might have to get my thing on full screen. Um, So here's a question. For a power of attorney, it was granted when the principal had capacity. The principal can only revoke it if the principal has capacity. The question is, so let's say principal doesn't have capacity. In theory, you know, doctor said lacks capacity. So the power of attorney is durable. Agent's authority, it continues. Will third parties such as bank act when the principal has told them not to act? And the answer is probably not. Um, the, the bank is probably going to, uh, um, you know, sort of accelerate that to their legal team. And they're, you know, because at that point, they now are on some sort of good faith notice that there may be some problem with this power of attorney. You know, the principal has told them one thing, unless they have, you know, 
you know, evidence and information that is satisfactory to them, and I don't know what that would be, that this principal, you know, doesn't, that lacks capacity and doesn't have the authority to undo what the agent is doing, they may sort of step back and say, whoa, you know, we're not going to get in the middle of this. We don't want to be liable. And that's the type of a situation where you may need to have um, a guardianship in place. Um, or, you know, maybe an attorney write a letter explaining that, you know, so-and-so um, lacks capacity. I've seen this happen a lot with healthcare providers where, you know, the, there's an agent appointed who's acting, the, you know, the, the individual now says they want an agent not involved, they hate the agent, all these, all these accusations are thrown about. And oftentimes the healthcare providers are aware that this individual is, is in his or her right mind when they're making these accusations or giving these directions. So they're sort of able to get around that. But with a bank, it's a little bit different. And, you know, every bank would look at that differently. But if I were representing that bank, I would sort of take a step back and probably not act until I get some further assurances or perhaps a, a court uh, guardianship order. Um, and I think the last one, let's see. If I'm understanding this one question, it's how can we present the recommendation for a power of attorney to an adult child if the adult child is not comfortable giving the rights to someone else? If they're not comfortable giving the rights to someone else, then I don't think they're a good candidate for a power of attorney. Um, you know, because again, we we want to treat someone with a di disability or diminished capacity just like any other client. We can counsel them as to why this is a good idea, and you know, maybe we could say, look, we're we're going to draft this so that it's springing. It only the, your agent's authority only comes into effect if two doctors have said that you're incapacitated. Um, but you know, if they're not comfortable giving that authority up, then you know, that, that just simply might not be a good option. But I would counsel them so that they're making an informed decision. Um, and I think we covered the, the statutory healthcare representative. So I guess I saw there was some problems with my computer. There was some dinging. Maybe I was garbled a little bit. My apologies. I, I, I think there probably were notifications on my email that were telling me something was happening on my calendar and I can't hear those. So I do apologize if it was difficult to hear it all, but I thank you all very much for joining. I wish you all the best and hope that we come out of this COVID crisis, you know, with a, a, all healthy, with a good perspective and um, you know, new, new look on life and, and better for it. So thank you so much to the Achieva folks. Thank you so much to the participants. And um, I don't know if, if Patty or Greg wants to say anything, but I will bow out at this point. Thank you, Nora. It's Patty. And thank you all for attending. That was an excellent presentation, Nora. And I know that we all really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your expertise in, in this area, um, especially during these circumstances, you know, when we're all at home and have kids at home and family at home. And, you know, it's, it's certainly different, but it was an excellent presentation. And as a reminder, this is recorded and put up on our website, uh, probably by the end of the day or Monday at the latest. So if you want to go back and, you know, hear anything that Nora went over, you know, it will be up there. But again, thank you, Nora. Thank you, Greg, for setting this up. We had a couple practice runs and um, I think it went great. And I, I really didn't notice much dinging or anything, Nora. So um, I thought it was great. So thank you again. Thank you all for attending. And as always, if, if there's anything that we can assist you at Achieva, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we do have people working in the office. Some of us are working remotely, but we are around and available to help any of you if you need anything. So thanks again and stay well, everyone.